Dr. Rafi Landovitz. He is a brilliant researcher, researcher and is so passionate about ending the HIV epidemic. He's one of, I think, one of the world's foremost experts on HIV prevention and different ways that we can prevent HIV infection. So Dr. Landovitz is gonna start us off tonight with what's new, what's exciting in terms of HIV prevention. Let's give a very warm Grove Level 8 welcome to Dr. Rafi Landovitz with honks and lights. Um, I'm going to be talking uh, very briefly about an update in HIV prevention, and I want us all to be thinking as we talk about HIV prevention to think about how far we've come in HIV prevention, the new technologies that have come to aid in the fight against HIV and AIDS and new acquisitions and new transmissions. And um, as we're gonna be hearing a little bit later from Dr. Dar, how we're leveraging some of these same prevention strategies to prevent COVID. I'm gonna be very brief here. Many of you are familiar with TDF-FTC or Truvada. It was the first drug that was approved for HIV prevention. It's approved for all populations. It's approved for gay men. Um, it's appro approved for heterosexual men. It's approved for cis and transgender women. Um, there aren't a lot of data for transmasculine populations, but um, there's no reason to think that it wouldn't work. We're working to get more data about it. And there's data for intravenous um, drug exposures as well. So this is our mo most robust data. Those of you who have heard me speak before know that this is my favorite slide on the planet because it distills down all of the clinical trials data that we have um, into one graphic and, and I get really bored and sleepy when people show me tables of data. So this, this, this graphic shows how effective Truvada was in each of the studies and the figure is based on the population, the sex at birth of the population in which it was studied. And what you sort of notice as you look across it is there's kind of, kind of um, uh, some are half filled, some are really filled, some are not filled at all, some are sort of standing in a puddle, um, and, and what's going on with that? And of course, now we know very well that the major answer to this story is adherence, that if you take the drug, it works really well and provides high level of HIV prevention, and that's really exciting. And many of you are, are familiar with the fact that the majority of the data on this slide represent daily administration of Truvada or TDF, FTC, except down in the lower right corner, where is this guy who sort of looks like a mime here. Um, and, and that actually wasn't my intent when I put it on there. Um, it, the study was done in France and Quebec, so that's why the beret is there. Um, the stripiness of him um, is really to indicate that for gay men and transgender women, this was a study that was done um, what's called pericoidally, what we commonly refer to as on demand, basically taking the PrEP medications right around sex. So people took a double dose of the true between two and 24 hours before planned sex, and then a second single dose, 24 hours after that first double dose, and then a third single dose of the Truvada, 24 hours after that second dose, and then they stopped. And that was 86% protective against HIV infection. Now, it was a lot of discussion in, in community chat rooms and when people were wondering, would this work? And, and people were saying, well, people are doing it, so we should study it and figure out if it works. People called it disco dosing, right? And the idea was, if you could plan for when you were having sexual activity, it could be really powerful. You didn't have to take it all the time but you could still get high levels of protection. And the answer is it does work, and it works really well. And I think a lot of us were surprised. Um, we were surprised that it worked um, to that level, but um, now in the guidelines, and especially in IAS USA guidelines, which came out um, just a couple of weeks ago, uh, as well as the WHO guidelines and the European guidelines for PrEP use, it's elevated to the same level as daily oral Truvada use for gay men. We don't have data for on-demand use in other populations yet. Stay tuned, more to come. So I think that's super exciting. The next thing I wanna talk about is TAF-FTC. TAF-FTC um, is a, a, a medicine called Descovy, and it last October, it's really unthinkable that it's been a year already that we've had regulatory approvals for it, was approved for daily use in, for all exposures except for vaginal exposures. So it's approved for rectal exposures, penile exposures, 
um, and, uh, and parenteral exposures, so drug use exposures. The reason this is different is because the version, the flavor, if you will, of the tenofovir that's in this, this, this tablet is, is slightly different. This is a little bit of a complicated slide, but what it's trying to show is that if you think of tenofovir as an ice cream cone, and the cone part is the active part, and the scoop of ice cream part is the part that just moves it to where it needs to be, the, the old tenofovir, or TDF, the ice cream cone falls apart into its cone and ice cream components in the blood. And what that means is the cone floats around and it bathes the bones and the kidneys in the cones, and kidneys and bones don't like cones. Um, and they cause damage to them. The difference with new tenofovir is the ice cream and the cone don't separate until the combination of the two is inside a cell. So there's 90% lower levels of cones floating around in the bloodstream. And it falls apart in the cells and is active in cells, so the kidneys and the bones see a lot less of the toxic ice cream cones. I hope that makes sense, and it seems like it works just as well in HIV treatment, so the question was, would it work just as well in HIV prevention? And it turns out it does, but it, we only have data at this point for gay men and transgender women. There are studies ongoing for cisgender women and other populations, but for right now, we only have data that's really robust for gay men and transgender women. And so people often come into my office and they say, well, I heard my friends are taking Descovy for PrEP instead of Truvada for PrEP, and should I be doing that? And this is a graphic that I stole from a woman named Julia Marcus, who's um, uh, an epidemiologist who's now at Harvard. She was at the Kaiser Foundation in Northern California. And I think it's kind of brilliant because it sort of breaks down what's good and what's not so good about each of the different drugs. Um, on the left here, you have the Truvada, and that's the one that we have the most knowledge about in terms of the populations that it works for. And on the right, we have the Descovy. And so what's really important here is, right, we've got data for the Descovy in gay men and transgender women. We don't have data for heterosexuals or people who inject drugs for Descovy. We do for Truvada. And then in terms of safety, this is really important. We talk about the bone and the kidney where really sensitive laboratory markers of it being safer were found in the TAF FTC arm, but they didn't have clinical correlates. So people didn't have more fractures. People didn't have to stop it because their kidneys got irritated more. They're these super sensitive markers of bone mineral density and kidney function. And what does that mean um, over the long term? We don't know yet. In, in people living with HIV, we do know that those are important clinical differences. But in the PrEP space where people are not living with HIV, it has not been shown to be clinically important yet. But what's less talked about are these two things here on the bottom. And um, compared to people who were taking the Truvada prep, the people who took the Descovy prep had higher LDL cholesterol levels. And also, they gained about a kilogram of weight every year. So that's sort of important differences between the two drugs that are also important to consider. Of course, Truvada also just became generic, and so we're expecting its cost to drop also. So that could be a concern also. So we need more data about the clinical differences here. We need more data about what the cost of the generic is. We need data for TAF, FTC, or Descovy in other populations other than gay men and transgender women. So earlier this year, we got some really exciting results from a study of cabotegravir, which is the first injectable PrEP agent. And the first data to be presented, um, and full disclosure, some of you know this, I was involved heavily with this study, so I'm a little biased in thinking it was pretty cool. Um, uh, a shot in the butt of this cabotegravir medication for gay men and transgender women um, was 66% uh, more effective than daily oral Truvada for HIV prevention. So that's really exciting. The most common side effect, thank you, whoever honked. Okay, I'm gonna try and do one of those heart things that they do like on TV, but I'm not good at it, so 
heart to you guys. Um, all right, the, the primary safety concern with the cabotegravir was actually injection site reactions. So not surprisingly, you get a shot in the butt, it hurts. Um, happily, it was very infrequently so severe and painful, the shot was, that people wanted to discontinue before of it. Usually people described it um, as if they had done um, a really hard glute workout. Um, and that their butt was sore for a couple of days after they got the shot. So that's super exciting, and we're looking forward, hopefully sometime next year, to regulatory approvals um, for cabotegravir. Now, last year when I presented that this study was ongoing, we didn't know the results yet, many of you asked, well, what about women? You know, um, more than half of the new HIV infections in the world, more, of, more than half of the people living with HIV are women, particularly in Sub-Saharan Africa, particularly in, in underrepresented um, and, um, and, uh, uh, and, and uh, disenfranchised from clinical research and often not engaged with more um, uh, m medical services that are targeted more at gay men and transgender women for HIV prevention here in the United States. What about them? We don't want women to be left behind. And I think I told you all that there was a sister study to 083 called, wait for it, this is sexy, 084. Do you love it, honk? Thank you. So with all of the excitement about the election, you might have missed the fact that HPTN 084 on Monday morning announced their results. And this is really exciting. Remember, they started about 11 months after 083, so it's not at all surprising that it's six months later that we're getting the results of 084. And I don't have a slide because I had to get these slides in before this past Monday when these results came out. But the long story short is in cisgender women, cabotegravir was 90% more effective than daily oral Truvada for preventing HIV infection in cisgender women. You're welcome. So that's incredibly exciting. That's the news about cabotegravir. And again, we can expect, we can hope that there will be regulatory approvals for this drug for all at-risk populations sometime, fingers crossed, in the next 12 months. When it will be available in pharmacies thereafter and what the cost will be and all of those kinds of questions, we don't have any answers to at this point. But this is incredibly exciting, a huge advance for prevention science, um, and, and I know we were all super excited about it. Okay, these were the results of 083. This is a little bit too sciencey. Let's move past it because I'm already talking too much. Last summer, um, the European Medicines Agency, which is um, the European equivalent of our FDA, granted regulatory approvals for um, a vaginal ring for HIV prevention for cisgender women. It was 30% effective against HIV um, acquisition in the randomized clinical trials that were placebo controlled. There were some open label extensions to those studies that suggested higher levels with higher um, rates of adherence of that dipivirine ring. And a lot of people said, why would you ever want something that's 30 to 50% effective? And it really caused this huge debate in the, in the HIV prevention community of really isn't the power in choice, right? If, if you know that a pill can be really, really, really effective, but it's dangerous, like someone might cause violence to you, act, act violently against you, persecute you, have stigma against you if they see you taking a pill that could be associated with HIV prevention, but a ring that is only 50% effective, you can use discreetly and no one knows, isn't that an important option to make available to women? It, yes, exactly. So this is something we struggle with in medicine, right? We want something that's highly effective and acceptable. But what do you do if you don't have something that's highly effective, but you have something that's pretty good and people will use it? It should be made available as a choice with a lot of education about what we know and what we don't know about it. And I think that we're gonna come back to this when we talk about COVID, right? We would love something that's 90% or more protective against getting COVID, but what if we had something that was 50%? Would we want it? 
Is it better than nothing? We're gonna have a lot more of those conversations as well. So this, the Depivirine ring is before the FDA now. They're deliberating about whether or not they're gonna prove it here in the US, but it does have regulatory approvals in Europe. And I think that's really exciting. And to me, this has ushered in um, the new era of PrEP. We, we've talked about PrEP. We've talked last year about PrEP 2.0. And I think now we're at PrEP 3.0 because it includes these new agents with TAF FTC. We've got the Depivirine ring in two studies. And now we have cabotegravir. And again, I apologize that I don't have an 084 figure in this slide, but the data just came out. And I promise the next time I speak to you, there'll be a woman getting a shot in the butt um, to accompany the rest of these figures. Okay, two last things I wanna tell you about that I think are super exciting. The first is a drug called lenacapavir. What? I know, lenacapavir. Um, it's a completely new class of drug. It's being developed by Gilead. It's what's called a capsid inhibitor. That's the class, like we have, nukes and non-nukes and protease inhibitors and integrase inhibitors. This is a capsid inhibitor. And it's, a, it's the first, first drug that we have in this class. And it's being studied both for HIV treatment in combination with, with other drugs, but also as a PrEP agent. And I want to just show you, this is what happens when a single dose of lenacapavir is given to people um, who are living with HIV who aren't on any other medications. And what you can see is by 10 days on the lenacapavir, their viral load went down by 2.3 logs. So it's a very powerful anti-HIV drug. And what's really sort of neat about it is it is a subcutaneous injection. So it's like insulin or some blood thinners that you sort of grab the skin in the, in the belly, you sort of pull it up and give it right under the skin there. Um, it could be given as infrequently as every six months. So it's going into clinical trials for PrEP right now. I know, right? Yes, I know. Um, now we're gonna wait another six months till we do that again, right? Okay, thanks. Um, that was a joke, you could laugh. Okay. Um, all right, so that drug, you're gonna start hearing about more. We don't know a lot about its safety profile yet because it hasn't been in a lot of people, but the idea of an injectable PrEP drug for different populations that wouldn't have cross resistance with treatment drugs that be given every six months could be super powerful. So I think that's really exciting and you're gonna be hearing more about it. And then the last thing I wanna tell you about is a, well, it's sort of a pill, but it's sort of more than a pill. It's a drug called Islatravir. You might have heard about it, you know, because all these drugs have super double secret code names before they have real names, right? So this was MK8591, right? Because that's sexy. Um, but now it has a name and it's Islatravir. It's also a new class of drugs. It's a nucleoside analog reverse transcriptase translocation inhibitor, what? Yeah, so we have nukes and we have non-nukes and now we have NRTTIs. Yeah, okay, it's Latravir. Anyway, it's a pill. It's being studied as part of treatment regimens and it looks very potent and has a very high variety of resistance and a good tolerability profile. What's super exciting about it is two things. First. In the PrEP space, it looks like it could be given as infrequently as once a month. What? Yeah. So plot twist. Imagine you could come into a doctor's office or have a nurse come to your house or even remember to take it yourself on the first of every month and you take a drug and that's it. That's pretty cool. If that works, that's gonna be very exciting. That drug in the PrEP context as a one monthly pill is finishing up phase two trials. It's starting phase three efficacy studies this spring. Stay tuned for more about that. There's a high probability that we're gonna be offering that study at the care center, so stay tuned about that. Um, and the other thing that's super exciting about this drug is um, the company that's developing it, which is Merck, they have a long history of developing um, implantable birth control. So the little rods here, um, that you see that are four centimeters by two centimeters, the, um, they can be, um, they can contain uh, a contraceptive agent and a lot of women use that as an implantable contraceptive device. It goes in the, on the underside of the arm and it can go in for a period of time up to six months, sometimes more, and then it's a minor surgical procedure to yank it out. They're even developing ones that are self-dissolving 
Um, uh, so it might even not have to be surgically removed. And so the, since the same company makes these sort of implantable technologies for birth control, they're now making it to see if they can put Islatrovir in it or, wait for it, Islatrovir and birth control in rods that would go in together. So you could have, right? So that's something called multi-purpose technology. So it would not only be HIV prevention, it would be birth, birth control family planning as well. So we're really trying to advance the field and move this forward. The implant is probably a little further behind in development than is the monthly pill. So we're probably gonna see the prep studies for the monthly pill first. And if that works, then they're gonna move into this implantable device. The, 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 re the regulatory approvals for a device like that actually get kind of complicated because the FDA and other regulatory agencies think about it as two separate things. There's the thing, the device that gets implanted, and there's the drug, so there's two concerns. So you sort of want to show that the drug works first, and then you move into the thing that delivers it. I hope that makes sense. So this is all, thank you. I'll take that as yes. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there because there's a lot more to talk about tonight. But, so, TDF, FTC, Truvada, PrEP, it set a really high bar for HIV prevention. That's a good thing. It also makes it really challenging to prove that new drugs work. But happily, we're doing it. You can use that, the Truvada on demand, 211, uh, pericoidally, or daily. Please, only gay men use the 211 dosing. No data yet for other populations, hopefully soon. TAF, FTC, Descovy, again, only data for gay men and trans women right now, cisgender women and other populations coming soon. Um, and cabotegravir, the depivirine ring, eslatrovir, lenacapavir, that's the future. Stay tuned for more. Thank you so much for your attention.